Okay, so we're live on Instagram to talk about the book club tonight. I am um, in my personal office. I have to tell you, I love being here. It's one of my favorite rooms in the house. And we're here tonight to talk about um, our book club selection, which is, where's my book? Okay, here it is. Uh, we're here tonight to talk about Hidden Valley Road. You know, my mentor, Maya Angelou, used to always say, that God put a rainbow in the clouds. God put a rainbow in the clouds. And if there's any kind of crisis, always look for what the rainbow is in the clouds. And I think if there's any rainbow we can find in the clouds right now, it is the fact that we have more time with ourselves and hopefully more time to read. I'm really excited about that. And to tell you about this book, you know, my latest book club selection, Hidden Valley Road. If you don't have it already, you can get it in a snap right now before I finish the next sentence. You can go to your icon uh, books if you have um, an iPhone and you can download this book because this is a book that everybody's talking about. And I'm telling you, it's the extraordinary and true story of the Galvin family. Now, they had 12 children. First children started back in the 50s, and over the years, they had over 12 children. And six of those children, over time, were shown to have schizophrenia. At a time when nobody knew what schizophrenia was, it was devastating, and it was a mysterious illness. And people really didn't know how to explain to themselves, and certainly to their, their families, what it was. So... I picked this book because I know that there are millions and millions of people throughout the world and families in particular who are dealing with the shame, with the secrecy, with the fear of mental illness in their own family. And Robert Kolker, the author of this book, has brought an incredible new perspective, I think, and understanding to what families are going through because he had to get the family's permission in order to do this. And I'm gonna check now and see if Robert Kolker, is Robert here? I don't see Robert. Hello, Robert. You just turned that around. What? He should be in the requests. Where is Robert? I don't see him. There he is. It's my daughter Tondo helping me here. Cause Tondo, say hello to the people. Hello, Ooh. people. Yes, cause you know I'm technically changed. Here I am. Oh, hey. Hi, Hi there. How are you? Needed a little daughter help, but here I am. <laughs> I've got two kids helping me, so I, I need oh, twice as much gosh. help. Well, it's a pleasure to have you join us here tonight. And before we get started, I wanted to just say that congratulations are in order. You know congratulations are in order, right? I am i couldn't be more honored, really. Thank you. Okay, so here, this is what's happened. I brought myself some champagne. <laughs> Do you have any? Uh, it's waiting. It's waiting. In your house, it's, tell, tell uh, yes. your wife there. Tell your yes, wife yes, to bring yes. out some champagne, because we're going to pop the champagne. I'm going to try to get it open here. Uh, oh. Okay. And the reason we're popping the champagne, y'all, those of you who don't know, who haven't had a chance to read the book yet, Robert Kolker, I just got the news about an hour ago that you are going to be number one on the New York Times bestsellers list. So I'm going to try this here. Hey. <laughs> Perfect pop, sir, just for you. Well done. Well done. You got yours? Okay. Yeah. Right. Pour a little champagne. Some in. Uh, uh, Here's I... to your number one premiering on the New York Times bestseller list for Hidden Valley Road. I would never, you know, you may not, here, cheers, first of all, cheers. Thank you, cheers. Okay. Let's <laughs> drink, drink up. Cheers, everybody who's watching. So I just got the news, you're number one. I will tell you that I chose this as a book club selection as I was just sharing with everybody because I've been working on this mental health special with Prince Harry for Apple TV Plus and have encountered so many families who are going through um, the stigma and the shame. Uh, at my own school, I was talking to one of my daughter girls years ago who said to me, um, you know, my mom is so weird. I don't think she's like other people's moms. 
you know, my mom always thinks somebody's following us. And anytime a friend comes to the house, she thinks they're part of the police. And I started to know that, you know, this young girl who was a part of my school was experiencing schizophrenia in her own mother and didn't have the words to describe what that was. So I have had some encounters with a number of people, some of them who've been through traumatic circumstances, who have been dealing with mental illness. And so I was attracted to this book because we were doing this special on mental illness. I wasn't even thinking about it as a book club. It's a true story. And I'm just curious, as I know a lot of other people are, how did you come to know this family? Um, well, first of all, I'm really very grateful to you that you chose the book, and I, and I know that the family is too. Um, they can't wait to talk to you. I, I'm, a, I'm a journalist. I, my career really took shape at New York Magazine, where I wrote feature stories and cover stories for 17 years, and I had a book of several years ago. The sorts of stories I do are really about human dramas that are, that are real-life dramas. And it's a bonus when those stories are also about very important issues that all of us face. And my goal in, in telling these stories is to try to make the world a little smaller. Don't, you have, a, don't you have a drama that's on Netflix right now? That's right. The first book I wrote, Lost Girls, uh, is about the unsolved Long Island serial killer case. But really, it's about the families affected by that case. And there's a movie on Netflix now starring Amy Ryan that, as an accident of timing, came out just a few weeks before this new book. So I'm, I, you know, I look for stories that where people are facing adversity, where people are, are experiencing something that, that sometimes gets swept under the rug or that people overlook. And when I met this family through my good friend, John Gluck, who went to high school with the youngest member of the family, oh. and the family told me that they had been through all of these hardships and now were ready to have their story told. I first thought how difficult it would be to get the perspectives of so many people. As you said, it's a family with 12 children. Mm -hmm. But then I thought, what an opportunity to really help people see something that often is so stigmatized, as, yeah. as you experienced with, with the young girls who came to you. Yeah. Um, so you so did you know anything about mental illness before? Were you interested in it or had members of your family? Um, I've had some members of my family with challenges, but certainly not schizophrenia. Yeah. That, that subject specifically was very new to me. And so it was a good mix of old and new. As a nonfiction author, I, I had talked to vulnerable people before and talked about difficult family situations before, but the schizophrenia part was new. And it be, became this whole saga in itself. It, you see in the book that, yeah. that our thinking about schizophrenia was so wrong for so long, so yeah. many debates. So many, so many wrong decisions and missteps, and that alone was a crazy story. Isn't it incredible how we got it so wrong, how they were blaming the mothers, how they were giving people electroshock treatment, how they would throw you in, a, a, in an institution and lock you up for years because yes. it was so misunderstood? Yes, and I'm not sure if your club got to it yet, but the people who, the people who were blaming the mothers, they were doing battle with the people who wanted to uh, sterilize or lobotomize mentally ill people. So it was like wrong against wrong, you know, yes, so yes, nobody yes. was right. So um, were you able to, I love how in the book, which as I said, you can get wherever books are sold y'all, or you can like download right now in a snap. I'm, I'm, I'm always fascinated how quickly you can download a book. Um, go to Apple Books right now. But I would say that what fascinates me is that every chapter you're looking at another member of the family and at first it's hard to keep track of everybody, but were you able to interview every member of the family or did other family members tell you about some of the other family members? I interviewed every surviving member. So there are three deceased sons, all of whom were mentally ill. So I interviewed the, uh, the remaining three mentally ill sons and, I, and the remaining six uh, well children. And I interviewed Mimi before her death in 2017 uh, I did not. The murder. Know, yes. Don, Don had died. Uh, Don had died several years earlier. Well, so, um, everybody was around. And your main con point of contact for the family was um, Mary. If those of you who are in the first four chapters was Mary, who later named herself Lindsay. And she still is, she's the youngest daughter. Right. What did Lindsay say when you told her that the book had been chosen for a book club? <laughs> well, uh, I'll just say that both she and her sister came to me at the same time, Margaret and, and 
Mary are, are very different people, but they both really wanted the story told, so it's to their credit. But yeah, when I told, when I told Mary, she, um, she said that when they were growing up, they would watch your show and they would look at each other and they would say, we're way more interesting than the people she has on right now. Well, they're darn right about that. <laughs> In all those years, I never interviewed a family that had six children with schizophrenia. But at the time, they didn't even know what to call it. It didn't even have a name. I want to get to some readers' questions. First one is from Ms. Alexandra Rogue. I like this question because most of my career, I've been very regimented on a strict schedule. And usually, I'm working with a whole studio full of people. So I've always been fascinated how writers work alone. So Ms. Alexandra Rogue wants to know, what is your writing process? Do you have a schedule that you follow? Um, I was really lucky with this book for it to be a full-time effort. You hear these stories of, of people who write, who wake up at four in the morning and write for three hours before going to their regular job. That just wasn't possible for me because I was learning about schizophrenia from the ground up and I had to hit the books pretty hard. So I, I treated it like a job and I tried to develop work-life balance. I, I got, our family got a dog because I was home all the time. That was the right time to get a dog. I took a cooking class. You know, I tried to make sure that you know, that nine to five, I was really working hard on the book, but that I was also having a life too, because this is very tricky and difficult material. Yeah, and what's tricky, tricky and difficult, uh, I must confess that some of the science, I kind of skipped over it to get to the family. Uh, but what you did was an incredible job of blending the science and the emotional issues of the family. What I really didn't want was a science chapter that would start with, Here's another fun fact I learned about schizophrenia. Yeah. Um, I wanted to make sure that those science chapters raised the stakes for the reader and made, and, and made you think that the family was, was, had even more going on that you really need to know, to know about as you were. I like this from Lauren in London has this question. Lauren, thank you so much. She says, An, uh, why do you believe now was the right time for this book? Do you think you could have put it out even 10 years earlier? There were some amazing uh, coincidences and amazing moments of timing, incidents of timing that made this the perfect time. Uh, not long after I first met the sisters over the phone, I called up Lynn DeLisi, the, one of the researchers who's featured in the book. She hadn't talked to the family in years. It turns out that she had just, was just about to publish findings where she had sequenced the genome of the family and hadn't even talked to them about it yet. So talk about amazing timing. Also, just a year before, the other researcher, Robert Friedman, who knew the family for decades, he had this amazing finding that I got to feature in the book. Finally, Mimi, after many, the mother of the family, after many years had finally come around and had decided it was all right to go public and was very enthusiastic about it and how good that she did because she ended up passing away, you know, within mm -hmm. a year of me meeting her. So I think if we had done it 10 years ago, there would have been less to report and probably more secrets to keep. Yeah, the, which brings me to this question from someone called Stay Home for Healthcare Workers. That's a good handle, can't say it enough. Stay Home for Healthcare Workers. They wanna know, uh, what measures do you think are needed to implement a change in the societal stigmas associated with mental illness? I think everyone needs to understand that early intervention can work wonders, particularly even with the most the most acute mental illnesses like schizophrenia, which we still don't really understand. But what we do understand now is that someone who has two or three psychotic breaks, but then has good care is doing much better than someone who is left alone because of a stigma and ends up having 30 and before mm -hmm. they're 25. So if you, if, if you go to your teenager who's feeling out of sorts, who's feeling uh, like a stranger to themselves, who is hearing voices, and get them immediate care and attention and don't ask for them to sweep it under the rug, then we're really going places. Yeah. Uh, Samantha Fitz has a question for me, I think is really important to address. She asks, what advice do you give to families, in particular African-American families that are afraid or embarrassed to discuss past family mental health issues and more significantly schizophrenia? What can families do to overcome the stigma and to begin to have open dialogue. Thank you, Samantha Fitz. Uh, back to the story of one of my South African daughters. 
who had never discussed it ever before with anybody in her family. I think if you, Samantha, have it in your family and you start talking about it with just one sister, brother, cousin, who's willing to talk about it, it begins to open up the aperture for the family to discuss it. And at first, as you know, Robert, very hard because everybody wants to act like it didn't happen or it didn't happen the way you remember it happening. But I think getting one member of the family, as in this story on Hidden Valley Road, the one member, uh, Lindsay, and then her sister, of course, Margaret, Mary and Margaret, were willing to talk about it in ways that other members of the family were not. It, I, I couldn't be more impressed with both of them and with the whole family. It took a long time for them to come forward. To answer your questioner, I, I think we all need to realize that the, the stigma is for a reason, and that's because for decades, when you've learned something was wrong with your child, your next question is, well, what did the parents do to them? And, and sometimes it, that might be the case, but with an acute mental illness like schizophrenia, it's genetic. I, I think that the, the lesson to drive home for all of us is this is not as uncommon as you think. There are at least 3 million Americans alone who suffer from it. Uh, that's like 1% of the population, essentially. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and it's, a, it's a real disease. It's not a, a failure of nerve or anything like that. Uh, I want to tell everybody, you can download the book by clicking the link in my bio. You don't even have to like go to Apple. You can just, that'll just take you right to Apple. It's, it's amazing how quickly you can get this book. Wow. So last question, here's from Queen Bee 1241. Um, Queen Bee wants to know, what's your favorite book growing up? I'm gonna let you answer that and then I'll, I'll have to ponder what was my favorite, favorite book. What was your favorite book growing up? Um, there, there was this fantasy series called The Dark is Rising by Susan Cooper that were like King Arthur legends that I, that I liked. I liked it because every book was completely different from the other and so it was really surprising going through with it, that that's what comes to mind immediately. Well, when I got older, I liked the funny stuff. I would like any sort of comic, a comedy book or any sort of joke book. That's good. I never was a comedy book writer. Well, of course, for me, growing up, favorite book changed my life. My Angelou's I Know Why the Cage Bird Sing. And then I grew up to be able to have her as a mentor and friend. And for a while, I thought, well, does everybody just grow up? And the person they were reading when they grew up becomes <laughs> their mentor and friend. Turns out that isn't the way it is for everybody. I just saw somebody ask, what is the name of the book? It's Hidden Valley Road. Uh, we are on chapters one through four right now at Oprah's Book Club, where we have discussions about it all the time. If you'd like to join in the discussion, you can click in my bio, you can get the book, you can buy it wherever books are sold. If you can't get out of your house, which none of us are supposed to be leaving, you can order it even from Amazon. However you choose to get your books, it's available now and already number one. Robert Coker, congratulations. I'm gonna I must drink thank up some you. more champagne. <laughs> congratulations to you. More champagne, please. <laughs> more champagne. Hey, more champagne, please. Thank and here you. Here we all will be discussing the book at Oprah's Book Club, doing the remaining chapters in the coming weeks, starting it's, again Monday. It's really been wonderful to follow the club along and to see everybody's comments. It's been a real thrill, the thrill of a lifetime it, to see that happen. Isn't it wonderful to see people respond in time as they're discovering yeah. it? Yeah, and everybody really, really just learning from each other. It's such a fascinating, intelligent, thoughtful group. I really yeah. I'm, people are saying Oprah's things. book club. Yes. Yeah, exactly. All right. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thanks Thank everybody. You. Stay home. Stay safe. Thanks so much. Thanks so much.